All right. Well, we've always done it this way, so I'm going to keep doing it until we change our mind. Let's go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. All right. And if you are a Rotarian or you'd like to participate with it, we do a little thing. Uh, this is what binds us all together, what brings us all together, no matter where you are in the world. Caitlin is the four way test. So, the four way test of the things we think, say, and do is it the is truth? Is it the truth? Is it fair? Is it fair? To all to all Will it, Will it build, 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 build good better, 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 better friendships? friendships? Will it be Will beneficial, it be beneficial, beneficial to, to all, all concerned? concerned? All right. Uh, I do see we have some guests. Let me pop open my window here so I can catch up. If there's anybody hiding behind a camera, let me know as well. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Besides our, our speaker, uh, Els, I see you, and I'm so happy to see you. Thanks for joining us today. I have a I have a little surprise here, Sam. Oh, okay. Um, can you see that here, guys? We, come behind you, me. You got a you got a background on your Zoom, so yeah. tell your guests to come a little closer to the camera, and I think it'll pick up. There we go. Hello, hello. We see we hello. see two faces. There's <laughs> Jen. It's okay. Jen and Bill, Van Englenberg. Hello. Hello, wow, wonderful. Oh, your club member you. finally got the Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. The silent members. <laughs> well, lovely, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. Uh, are there any other guests today? I don't see any visitors or guests, yeah? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and uh, kick some things off. We need a bank account for our 501c3. Oh, I had never fixed the stinking typo on. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, it's an old version I gave to, um, to Denise today. But uh, we need a bank account for our 501c3. And um, we're looking for some, some guidance from the district about that as well. So we're making progress with that. Um, anything you donate to, uh, to the club via this QR code, in case you uh, you forgot anything you donate through Venmo, go straight to the bank account for the um, for the club, and we're going to create another foundation account in the next uh, in the next week or so. So, uh, with that, let's see about any other announcements before I move on. Anything else anybody wants to share? No. Okay. All right. Let's talk about how we fix the planet. So our tradition here. Uh, that we just started, Caitlin, in the last couple of weeks is to talk about how we impact our environment around us and how we make positive changes, uh, because that's our that's our club, that's our foundation, that's our focus, that's our mission. And we have uh, adopted the uh, the hashtag I Fix the Planet, which is a social media hashtag, obviously. And uh, we like to go around and talk about how we fix the planet the last week or over the next week. So, Roger, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I, uh, I signed up for that sustainable living course, uh, which is going to start in September. So I'll be interested to see what we get out of that. But that's what I did this week to help fix the planet. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else have anything you want to share? Environmentally focused or? Good. Good. Roger, I'm not going to spill the beans about your uh, your idea, but I've started poking around to see what we can do to put our name on some some ecologically friendly things uh, around town. But uh, I've already started poking around on that. That was a great idea. All right. I don't see anything else. Is there? Let me just uh, check and see if there's anything in the chat. Oh, OK, I, I see you there, Susie. And we can see you, by the way, Susie, just in case. Can you, you see me? Am I on the video, too? It's not showing me anything. We can't. We can't. Okay. You look, great. you look great. All right. Yeah, I don't know about that, but thanks. Okay. I might <laughs> turn that off in a minute. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to take over? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll do the sergeant. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Caitlin, we most rotary clubs do um that you might attend do a uh, sergeant at arms and they do different things that people might want to donate a dollar for. Certain clubs, like in Las Vegas, I think they donate like 50 and hundred dollars at a time, but we're not that wealthy. Um, so what people do is they just donate it via the Venmo, um, the Venmo link here or other different other ways that they can do it. Um, just as they, um, uh, you know, I like I do it once a quarter just to kind of say, oh, yeah, I think I did this much. Um, it's on an honor system. So having said that, um, 
anyone who is in an area that is not sweltering right now, or maybe lives in an area that is not sweltering, should maybe be happy and donate a dollar. So if you're living in Florida right now, you're probably not very happy. And I never wanna... leave the house. I'm always in my AC. Does that count? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. That means you should pay a dollar because you're comfortably, um, you're living comfortably. Whereas I go out and do, well, you go outside, don't you? You run and stuff. That's true. Early in the morning, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> So anyway, all right. So anybody who might have a dollar go ahead for that, who's living somewhere like maybe Finland or West Virginia or someone who's visiting. Obviously, you've Maryland. never been to West Virginia where the humidity is the same as the temperature. Oh, yeah. But you saw mountains to look at. Or Pac, or Pac Northwest. Or what? The Pacific, uh, the Pacific Northwest. Northwest. Yeah, I was thinking there's a couple people on the Pacific Northwest who are visiting Florida right now, but they do get to oh, escape okay. from it. So, <laughs> all right, moving on though. Do we have any birthdays this, this week? In the last week or so coming up? Nobody? All right, how about um, anniversaries? Anything like that exciting? Nope. All right, moving on. Um, anything that we should be sad about? I think we should be sad about the world heat right now. I think most of us, given that we're the eco-friendly Rotary Club, should pay a dollar for being sad about what's happening in the world because our, every, the entire world is basically on fire, I think. so. Kimberly, were you going to say something? Well, I, I, I would have been. My grandson just missed it. He was in Italy and, and, um, and Greece, but got back just before the worst of it hit. Mm -hmm. uh, they're even evacuating Athens. They've closed the Acropolis. There are wow. fires outside of Athens. Spain is on fire. Italy is scorching. Yeah. And, those, and a lot, and remember, they don't have, a lot of those places don't have air conditioning. Yeah, or even fans. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's all you live with over there if you're lucky enough to have a fan. So when it gets that hot, it's, it's literally deadly. So I, I, yeah. I agree, we should pay a dollar for that, if yeah. not more. <laughs> yeah, well, it's gonna cost us in the end. Uh, yeah, it's, it's already difference. costing us. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's the only sad thing. So how about any happy bucks? Do we have anything we're happy about this week? Roger. Yeah, yeah I've got I've got two things. Uh, first is I, I missed my grandson's birthday to make the announcement about that. He's turning five Aww. on Wednesday. On Saturday, we had his birthday party and he insisted he was not yet five. He was still four. <laughs> so that was, <laughs> I know it was like hey, okay. Anyway, he's going to be tomorrow, an engineer when he grows up, isn't he? Yeah, yeah they're so literal at that age. Yeah, absolutely. The second thing is, I want to congratulate Sam on getting the uh, the Google Workspace. That's quite an accomplishment to do it, especially at the district level. I tried for years at our club level to to kind of get that going and get the club to agree. So I think that's fantastic. Uh, we're going to get a lot of use out of that. So way to go, Sam. Yeah. Thank you. Well, if anybody, I... It, could I, could I, could I yeah. uh, plug on behalf of the club there? So on that note, there are two opportunities that every Rotarian in this district, but specifically this club, you have two opportunities. One, you can email me um, and with the district approval or whatnot, we're happy to provision an account with a rotary6930.org. Meaning, you could email me and say, I want to be um, uh, Grimace. It's his birthday, by the way. I'm not sure if you pay attention. You could email me, I want to be Grimace, the purple guy at Rotary 6930, whatever. And I can provision that account for you. I can also do the same thing for the eco friendly Rotary. So we can have eco friendly Rotary specific accounts um, that only live within this club. And that means it's unlimited storage, it's YouTube, it's it's email, it's calendars, it's everything. So it's a lot of resources at our disposal. So depending on what you'd like your audience or what you'd like your appearance or your persona to be, let me know and I'm happy to do that. There's no cost whatsoever and you can immediately start using it with, again, free storage. You can have your own persona. You can be, you know, whoever you want to be at, at uh, Rotary 6 and 930 or EcoFriendly. Back to you, Susie. All right, well, that's what I was gonna ask you to explain what it was, so perfect. Well done, well done reading my mind. Kimberly. So I have, I have two things that, about which I'm very happy. 
The first is uh, Denise, we, we, we will be having um, uh, a rotary meeting on the 8th, the weekend of the 8th of September in, in Parafugal in, in Spain, which is about an hour north of Barcelona. And um, so it, it, Denise will be coming down on the, on the, on the Friday. I've made reservations for us on the Saturday at a Michelin star restaurant, uh, the Casamar. So if you, the Europeans or anyone else would like to come and, 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 uh, and visit and have a rotary meeting over in, in Barcelona or north of Barcelona on the beach on the Costa Brava, I'm happy to welcome you. You probably at this point will have to bring a sleeping bag because it's only a two bedroom condo that I'm renting. So, uh, but, 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 we will, but we will be having our rotary meeting in person there. And Denise, I've already arranged to pick her up at the airport. Awesome. So, How I'm really fun. excited about that. And, uh, and the reservations are for Saturday night at 8.30 and I can, I, I can add more people. I've never been, I have to say, I've never been to a Michelin star restaurant. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and the second is I have submitted the three, uh, Jen and, and Denise, because they joined a fellowship. I have submitted their Paul Harris and one other for, uh, for ser service above and beyond. Uh, she's not on this call today, I don't think, but I I'm not going to mention that, but uh, who it is, but uh, certainly someone who has gone above and beyond and shown the true rotary spirit. Uh, so I've submitted three people for Paul Harris recognition. So again, I haven't come near to eating up all my points. If you join a fellowship, let me know and I, I, I will submit your, I will submit the application and, and appoint you as a Paul Harris. Well done. Excellent. Okay, okay. that's it. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for that. And thanks for submitting your points for You're Paul welcome. Harris fellowships. Oh, of course. Um, what else can I do with them? Yeah, you can't spend them. Miss mm -hmm. Ailish. What have you got for us today? I have a few happy dollars. Okay. Um, number one is I got my three poems, my three poems published in the literary magazine, and I've just posted it there for everyone to see. I'm thrilled. I'm delighted. They're all a bit dark and brooding. But as a friend of mine emailed me and said, dark and dark and brooding is the soul of poetry. So I'm not sure she's right. But anyway. Uh, I'm thrilled. I'm delighted. Um, I was one of five poets that were published in this literary magazine, and they had over apparently they had over five thousand poem, poem, poems that were submitted. So anyway, I'm thrilled about that. The other one, delighted to see Els again. How are you, Els? I hope you're well. Good to see you. And also, and also, and and also, Yannicka. Good to I'm see doing you good. Here. I'm doing good, Alicia. Thank you. Good. I'm glad. I'm, I, um, and also, Yannicka, delighted that you're here again and so looking forward to you becoming a full member. And we need wonderful people like you who have youth and vim and vigor and um, help us along. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ailish. And Els, you have your hand up. It was more for Jen. I just wanted to thank uh, thank you for the Paul Harris. I just I did get the certificate and the pin a couple of weeks ago, so I was I was very welcomed and very very appreciated. Well done. It's good to see you finally. Well, we can't really see you, but we can see you from the picture of Els. But we know you're there. All right, great that you could join us. So wonderful to have you. Okay, anybody got anything else they'd like to share? Not a today. Okay, well, uh, with that, I'm going to go off video so I can eat lunch and listen. And um, everyone, um, we'll talk to you soon. I'm looking forward to hearing about the Marine Resources Council. Thank you, Susie. And that brings us to our guest. Our guest is Caitlin. Now, Caitlin, uh, she has some camera issues today, so I apologize. You're going to have to settle for the cute dolphin pic. Uh, Caitlin. <laughs> uh, Caitlin is the community environmental educator at the MRC. Originally from California, she has always had a love for the ocean and animals that inhabit it. During college at U UC Santa Cruz, Caitlin cared for rescued sea lions and seals at the Marine Mammal Center and cared for and trained dolphins, sea otters, and seals at the Marine Mammal uh, Physi Physiology Project. After graduating with a BS in marine biology and a minor in psychology, she jetted off to Honolulu, Hawaii, to work as a dolphin trainer, leading swim with the dolphin programs and educating the public on marine conservation. 
It was there that she realized her passion for teaching and not only applies uh, to those with flippers, but to humans as well. Now in Florida, Caitlin loves being near the water, trying to spot some of her old friends coming up for a breath. So with that, Caitlin, I will turn over to you. Thank you for, for being here with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me and apologies for my, uh, my camera not wanting to play nice today. Um, but I'll go ahead and get this presentation started. So it kind of sounds like some of you guys are from Florida. Is that correct? Yeah, we have, um, I guess just to, to go really quickly, we have uh, roots in UK, Ireland, uh, Finland, uh, physically in Finland is Janneke at the moment. The rest of it, I think, are in the U.S. Oh, and roots in uh, the Netherlands, France, Netherlands, yep, Ireland. That's so amazing! Really cool. So I'm glad that we can uh, bring the Indian River Lagoons plight to light um, in many different areas of the world. Um, so again, thank you so much for having me. First to all, share with you all a little bit about the Marine Resources Council. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit um, founded in the 80s by a group of Florida Tech professors. That's the university that's oh, just a hop, skip, and a jump away from us. Um, and those professors sort of saw the direction that our beautiful lagoon um, was heading in um, already back then. Since then, we've had um, many algae bloom events, lots of pollution that has um, really been um, not so great for the health of our lagoon. So we were founded um, already seeing this issue starting um, over 30 years ago, um, actually 40 years ago at this point. So that blue house on the right in that picture, that is our headquarters. Um, I'm inside the, the big door where you see the people standing right now. <laughs> and at the Marine Resources Council, our mission is to protect and restore the lagoon um, through science, restoration, and education. So our biggest science project that we do every year is a report card. Um, this year, we've just transitioned to a progress report where we sort of grade the health of the lagoon up and down the um, 156 miles along the east coast of Florida that it spans. Um, and then you're obviously here for the education portion of our mission now, but for restoration, we actually have a state licensed mangrove nursery, um, so we can get mangroves um, growing and healthy and then eventually deploy them into the lagoon. So for those of you who aren't Florida locals, um, we'll do a quick overview of our lagoon. So we take up about a third of Florida's east coast. Um, it stretches all the way from Ponce de Leon Inlet up in New Smyrna Beach all the way down to Jupiter Inlet in Fort Pierce. Um, so from about where I am right now, that's like if I was to drive from um, here to Disney World and back, which is a trip that I do not want to take. That is a long drive. Um, so 156 miles. Our watershed is over 2,200 square miles. So people who are in Orlando, their water that's discharged will actually eventually make its way to our lagoon. Huge watershed. Um, on average, our lagoon is about four feet deep, very shallow, spans anywhere from a half mile wide up to five miles wide. And our lagoon is actually an estuary of national significance. There's only 28 of them in the entire nation. Um, so it's very special that we are designated as an estuary of national significance. And in fact, our estuary is the most biodiverse estuary in North America. So really, really special place that, that we live. Um, I don't think a lot of people really recognize that, but it's so important um, that, we, that we protect this incredibly unique environment. You'll notice I called the Indian River Lagoon a lagoon, but then I also said it is an estuary of national significance. So which one is it? Um, you can see I've got a couple definitions up here, an estuary versus a lagoon. Um, Basically, estuary is saying that it's a transition zone between river and marine environments. Lagoon, much more simple definition. It's just a shallow body of water that's connected to a bigger body of water. Um, the answer though, is that it's actually both. Our Indian River Lagoon is also an estuary, but one thing that our Indian River Lagoon is not, is it is not a river. Um, rivers have to have a source and a mouth, and um, our lagoon does not have either one of those. So it's a little bit of a tricky name, but um, we are a lagoon and an estuary here. And this environment 
um, not only is it incredibly biodiverse, but it is critical habitat for so many different animals. Um, animals that grow up to either live out their whole lifespan in the lagoon or actually transition from the lagoon to life out in the ocean. And in fact, it's 4,300 different species of plants and animals that depend upon the lagoon. When people sort of think about animals that depend on the lagoon, they're gonna think of fish, they're gonna think of manatees or dolphins, right? Um, but there are so many terrestrial animals um, and animals that inhabit the air as well too that depend upon the lagoon for, for food, for water, um, for resources. So um, it's very, very important. We have a lot of pictures of animals here, um, but we have some amazing plants as well too and we'll get into that a little bit later. And that is a beautiful picture of what our lagoon used to look like. So towering mangrove forest, right? We're not seeing the typical Florida development with, you know, houses budding up right next to the water, docks stretching out. Um, this system here, this estuary is naturally resilient. Um, we've, we've changed that a bit, but some of those um, resiliencies are from mangroves. Mangroves are an incredible tree species. Um, they can live in salt water and survive. No other tree species can do that. So this here you see is a picture of a red mangrove. The way that you can tell red mangroves apart from others is they have those amazing prop roots that stick down off of their trunk and go down into the water and root into the ground. So they, these trees are not only amazing for capturing carbon from the air, depositing it in the soil beneath um, and taking up nutrients from the water um, to reduce pollution in the water. But they also are so important for us as humans because they accrete sand behind them, stopping erosion as well as breaking waves. So when we think of hurricanes um, that roll through our area, if we have a place that has thick mangrove forest, the land behind it is not going to be effective because those mangrove prop roots really act as wave breaks and just break up all that wave energy protecting the land behind it. So they're a super plant. Another amazing plant that our lagoon has and unfortunately doesn't have a lot of right now is seagrass. So like mangroves, seagrasses can also remove nutrients from the water. Um, in addition, they reduce turbidity as well too. The blades that stick up can sort of trap sediment in them, but also the plant's rhizomes extend both horizontally and vertically. So again, if we have a thing like a, a big hurricane roll through and there's tons of surge and wave action, those rhizomes really hold the ground in place. So we're not getting all this churning and all this um, sediment and debris up in the water column in places that have seagrass during storms. Um, in addition, seagrass um, is also a major food source for many different animals, as well as a um, home for for fish to have their babies. Um, lots of fish that become game fish out in the open ocean will come into the lagoon and into the seagrass to lay their eggs and it's a great place for their babies to hide while they're still young enough to be living in the lagoon before they go out to the ocean. So really important um, for so many different types of animals. And that's of course what our uh, lagoon water clarity used to look like. Um, for those of you guys that are not in Florida, um, you might see this when you go to places like Hawaii or you know the Bahamas, but um, this is what our, our lagoon used to look like. Um, now it's, it's pretty murky. Um, you'll see some pictures of that a bit later, but um, this, is, this is the picture of health. This is what we want to get back to. As I mentioned, we changed the lagoon. Um, when I have a, a group of people in the room, I usually ask people to raise their hands and tell me what looks not natural in this picture. And there's a lot. Um, the first thing is this causeway, right? So we've got a big bridge going over the lagoon. That's absolutely human made. We've got that condo that the causeway is leading to in the back, um, right up against the water as well too. We have a hardened shoreline. So a seawall that's up near the front of the picture. Um, not natural at all, in fact, very bad for storms. Um, and then we also have some non-native palm trees in the front there. 
I think people, when they think of Florida, they just think of every type of palm tree lives in Florida because it's tropical paradise. Um, but that's not true. Um, our palm trees look different. This is, these are palm trees from somewhere else in the world um, and they, they don't belong in these soils, but they do great in our soils. So there is a picture of what the lagoon looks like today on the left. So we've got houses, golf courses, roads that are literally right up next to the lagoon. Um, we dredged so much in the lagoon as well too to be able to get our boats through, creating spoil islands, which are those islands that are in the middle of um, the, the lagoon there. Um, not natural, those are, those are human made. We took all of the spoils from our, our dredging and piled them up in one place. Um, they make great bird habitat now, um, but if you sort of think about that many people being right next to the lagoon, right on top of the water, you can also think about all of the storm water that is running directly off of their property and straight into the lagoon. Um, if you sort of see on the right third of that picture on the left, there's a bunch of houses that are right around uh, sort of a mini lagoon. And you can tell that the color of that water looks a lot different than the color of the water that's outside of the mouth of that lagoon. Um, that's so much runoff that is going into that, that smaller body of water and there's probably a decent amount of algae that is in there. So storm water. Um, when you think of Florida sort of in the prairies in the middle of Florida, you've got soft grasses, you've got lots of soil. So if we have a huge rainstorm, all of that rain gets filtered out by the grass, by the soil, um, through the ground before it makes our way, its way to our lagoon. If you think about a neighborhood that we live in, we have so many impervious services. We have roofs, driveways, sidewalks, streets that don't filter the rainwater. So instead, the rainwater runs right off all of those impervious surfaces down the storm drain and into the lagoon. And as it's running into the lagoon, it picks up all of the nutrients that come along with our lives and brings it into the lagoon with it. So that's where our, you know, leaky uh, cars, oil spills come from. Um, the detergents that we're washing our car with, pet waste, grass clippings, fertilizers, all of these um, things that are huge sources of nutrients running straight into the lagoon because of those impervious surfaces. And that creates this horrible process called eutrophication. Um, don't know if anyone has heard that vocabulary word before, but um, if you haven't, it's top of your list for, for new vocab words for today. So this process um, is great. It's explained just by this, oh, it's explained wonderfully by this little um, diagram here. So we've got runoff coming from three different sources, our urban, agricultural, and residential. So those nutrients are gonna be, the, the heavy hitters are gonna be nitrogen and phosphorus. So that's all running into the river and, or into the lagoon. And what it's um, doing is it's fueling algae blooms. Algae is basically taking those nutrients and saying, yum, this is exactly what I want to grow. So these algae blooms are just becoming super prevalent across the lagoon. And if you've seen one before, um, it looks so thick, like you can walk on top of it. So that algae floating on top of the water blocks all the sunlight from reaching the bottom. Now, what lives on the bottom of the lagoon? Seagrass. So if seagrass can't photosynthesize because the algae is blocking the sunlight, that seagrass is going to die. And if seagrass dies, there's gonna be no dissolved oxygen in the water, meaning that fish die. Also, if the seagrass is dead, then animals that eat the seagrass aren't going to be able to survive as well too. So these algae blooms just create this chain of death. So we have seagrass sinking to the bottom because it's dying, fish sinking to the bottom because they're dying. Um, the algae eventually itself is going to die and sink to the bottom. So we have all of these layers on the bottom of layer after layer of decomposing organic material. The problem is, is that if there's so much decomposing material on top of decomposing material, the layers at the bottom aren't going to be able to fully decompose. So you're gonna have a lot of nutrients just left over, partially decomposed, hanging out at the bottom of the lagoon. When we have a big like hurricane or a warm winter um, and the bottom gets all churned up, 
then it's re-releasing those nutrients and fueling another algae bloom. So it's a positive feedback cycle, hard to break, um, and just really, really affordable for the health of the lagoon. So this is muck. Muck is what I'm talking about when I say layer after layer after layer of partially decomposed um, organic material. So you can see on the left, normal sediment is only 2% organic. Muck, however, is 10%. So that is a big, big difference, right? When normally we're supposed to have 92% sand um, and then we have all of this runoff into the lagoon that decreases that amount of sand and increases the amount of silt and clay. When you step in it, it is like, um, like stinky goop. It's really gross. So muck, nothing can live in it. It's not beneficial for the lagoon. Um, yeah, nothing can grow in it. It's just, it's bad, it's gross. We gotta get it out of the lagoon. And this is what I was talking about when I'm saying the algae looks so that you can walk on it. Um, that picture on the right there is not grass. Um, if you were to actually step on that, you'd fall right through and I would not want to put my head under that water. <laughs> so um, this is what an algae bloom in Florida can look like and it creates these massive fish kills. Um, if there's no seagrass to make dissolved oxygen in the water, these poor fish um, are literally suffocating in the water. So this graph is old, but I like what it shows. Um, and it is still very relevant because our seagrass um, is not super, it's not doing well still. It's still in, in, still in decline. Um, but I like this graph because it shows that, you know, seagrass also is important to humans. So I had mentioned before that, you know, seagrass is critical for the animals that eat it, for the animals that have their babies in it, and the, the animals that use it as, as cover when they're growing up. Um, but also seagrass brings to our five counties along the lagoon revenue from tourism dollars. So if any of you are going to come visit us in Florida, you probably would envision that you would do things like deep sea fishing, right? Um, you'd hop on a boat out of Cocoa Beach and you'd head on out to the continental shelf and you'd go get yourself some, some big fish, right? Well, the problem is, is that if those fish that you're fishing out for in the ocean can't have their babies in the seagrass in the lagoon, you know, we're not going to have those fish. People are not going to come here to go on their deep sea fishing trips. They're going to go somewhere else. You also probably envision that you'd go on a kayak tour and go looking for manatees, right? But if the manatees have no seagrass to eat and they're starving, then you're not gonna find many manatees here. They're gonna be somewhere else or unfortunately they're going to be dead. So, um, yep, did I have a question? Yeah, Caitlin, um, this is Susie. I, I, um, I see this ends in 2012, how much worse yep. is it now? Yeah, we, we're still not doing well. Um, what we, we've heard recently is that actually in the Mosquito Lagoon, which is part of the Indian River Lagoon system, there is some flowering seagrass. However, not a lot is known right now about the amount um, or the distribution of it. Mm -hmm. So um, our water quality right now is slowly, ever so slightly trending up, um, but our seagrass is not following the same trend line as our water quality, which historically it has followed the same trend line. Mm -hmm. um, what we're thinking is that we need to increase the amount of water testing that the state is doing right now. So currently they're really only testing for nitrogen and phosphorus in addition to a couple other things. But as I said before, nitrogen and phosphorus are the heavy hitters. But mm -hmm. if, you know, there's, there's something that has changed and if it was just nitrogen and phosphorus and our water quality was getting better, nitrogen and phosphorus levels were going down, then our seagrass would be getting better, but it's not in that same trend. So what we're thinking is that we need to extend our testing to also include herbicides and pesticides. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Because um, if you think about all the retention ponds that are in your, you know, your HOA, and sometimes you might see your HOA spraying down the retention pond to kill the algae, what they're spraying it with is a chemical that blocks photosynthesis. And if the half-life of that chemical is long enough, it could be making its way to the lagoon and also having an effect on the seagrass too. So um, we need to see what is in the water. We need to know what is in the water um, to really see 
the whole picture of what's going on with the seagrass right now. I had a also, Sam. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I had a question earlier too. Um, if you don't mind, Caitlin, I was going to ask about the impact of uh, uh, is it sargasso? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Sargasso? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, my, I speak Spanish at home. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah. What's the impact of of that? Is that in terms of just being ugly? I understand that's just nasty and smelly and stinky and it smells like rotten eggs. Yeah. Uh, my wife is is from the Yucatan. Well, she's from Mexico. We'd like to go to the Yucatan. And the the sargasso there is just just horrendous. It's absolutely terrible. And and my understanding was that it was from uh runoff from, for example, like the African, the the western coast of Africa, um, and you know, chemicals, fertilizers, et cetera, there. But do you do you have any any thoughts on that? Because we I do seem to notice a lot of, you know, just junk and and stinky stuff on the beaches here on the treasure coast as well. Yeah, so the I, from how I understand it, sargassum is going to be affecting the beaches more. Um, it would have to make its way through the inlets in order to have an effect on the lagoon. And because we don't have that many inlets along the lagoon, um, I really don't think the sargassum is having a, a huge effect on it. Um, people will ask all the times to all the time to well, can't manatees eat? algae and technically they could they could eat algae they could eat sargassum um but it's not healthy for them it's it's you know like if we were trying to you know live off you know romaine lettuce for the rest of our lives right that's not the nutrients that we need um so i don't really think sargassum has a has a huge effect on on the lagoon but the beaches it absolutely does it's it, you're right it's disgusting it's smelly it's <laughs> it's pretty nasty stuff <laughs> maybe we should maybe we should bring in um uh, nutria rats to see if they could eat the the algae. Sorry, that's just a terrible joke from Louisiana. We had the same <laughs> Louisiana the coastal erosion. We brought in outside plants to restore the coastline, and the outside plants got out of control and killed the native plants. And we brought in rodents from <laughs> from South America and Australia to eat them, and then those got out of control, and now they're killing all the wildlife too. Yeah, that's an incredibly slippery slope to get on. Is the introduction of um, non-native or invasive species so um i don't i don't think that is in the plan for the lagoon um but yeah for the, the sargassum i don't think is, is going to really be contributing massively to any sort of water quality issue in the lagoon all right so it was all pretty negative stuff right um but there's a lot that we can do as floridians to help um, or even if you are an ecotourist and you are coming to Florida, there's stuff that you can do to help as well too. So first thing is for us Floridians is to change how we care for our lawn. Um, in our, our county here, Brevard County, and in many places along the um, lagoon and even along the Gulf Coast, we have fertilizer laws. Those laws are not to apply fertilizer in the summer, so that's our wet season. It's a pretty common misconception that rain is going to soak your fertilizer into your lawn. Um, what it really does is it just washes the fertilizer right off into the nearest water body. So we are not allowed to fertilize during the summer. We're also not allowed to fertilize within 10 feet of water. And some counties even have a larger buffer up to 15 feet. Um, and that's just to make sure that there's, there's a buffer zone so that we're not putting fertilizer granules right next to our retention pond where it's just going to easily fall in or run off into. Um, we also are not supposed to use fertilizer that has less than 50% slow release nitrogen um, and also not use fertilizer that has phosphorus in it. So I'll talk a little bit about fertilizer because this is useful for everybody to know, um, not just us Floridians, but I had no idea um, that you know, fertilizer sort of has like a, like a nutritional content, like the back of a box of cookies on the, on the bag of fertilizer. So um, on the front of the bag, you're going to see three numbers. Those are your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium. And that's the percentage of each one of those nutrients that's in the bag. So if you are complying with our fertilizer laws, your middle number, your phosphorus should be zero. Um, for nitrogen, the way to see that your fertilizer has slow release nitrogen is you go to the back to that nutritional analysis, um, like on your cookies, and it's going to say your percentage of nitrogen that was on the front. So let's say a really common one is 16% nitrogen. That's your total nitrogen that's in the bag. 
if you go all the way down to the very bottom of that um, guaranteed analysis, then there's going to be another number down there. And it's going to say something like slow release, coded, slowly available nitrogen. And that number should be half of the total um, nitrogen number. So in our example, the common nitrogen content was 16%. Your slowly available um, number needs to be at least 8% for it to be 50% slow release nitrogen. So I didn't know any of that. Um, it's really helpful to know, um, like I said, not just for Escalardians, but for everywhere. If you are going to fertilize your lawn, it is best to use slow release nitrogen. Um, and the reason why is because the you know, the fast release, the quick release, that's the stuff that greens up your lawn immediately and makes it grow super tall. But that also really hurts the root systems of your grass and it makes it really shallow. So slow release nitrogen is not only better for the environment, it's actually better for your lawn too. So knowing your fertilizer laws is a very important um, for the health of the lagoon. So we're not having excess fertilizer running off into the lagoon, um, but also blowing your grass clippings back onto the lawn instead of off into the street and into the storm drain. That's just going to release nutrients into the lagoon instead of leaving the clippings on your lawn. So it releases nutrients back onto your lawn. It's naturally a fertilizer. So that's really awesome um, to be able to use your clippings as fertilizer. Um, I also have plant natives on there. We sort of touched on this too with the um, slippery slope of introducing non-native um, plants and animals, um, but native plants don't require fertilizer. They don't require any special watering. They are meant to live in Florida or in the area that you live, um, and they're super easy to take care of. For example, I have a brown thumb. Um, I kill more plants than I help survive. So natives are the way to go for me. So I have less work to do. And they are beautiful to look at as well. And then it's also good to be aware of nutrients from unexpected sources. So if anyone here is a dog owner, um, your dog poop, we don't want to think about it containing nutrients, but it sure does. So if, it's, <laughs> if you're taking your dog out for a walk, it's really important to pick up after your dog so that poop doesn't run off into the storm drain or just rain doesn't carry nutrients from it into the storm drain and then into the lagoon. Um, and then car washes, right? This is a great excuse for you to take a load off and not wash your car, is just bring it to the car wash instead. When you wash your car on your driveway at home, that soap is running off into the storm drain. Um, if you take your car to a car wash instead, they have to treat their water or they recycle it. Um, so that's a lot better for the lagoon. Um, if you are going to wash your car at home, you can actually wash your car on your grass and then it gives the, the soap and the detergents a chance to be filtered through by your grass. And if you are in the area, you can always come volunteer with us. Um, we have a ton of great volunteer options um, for everybody, even kids too. So we have mangrove nur nursery uh, workshops, as I mentioned, at our state licensed mangrove nursery. Um, we also help raise awareness that everything goes uh, to the lagoon that goes down the storm drains. So we help mark storm drains in um, the cities of Melbourne and Coco um, to bring awareness to neighborhood. Um, we have a really cool um, science project called Lagoon Watch. It's been going for, I want to say, 32 years at this point. Um, and this is where citizen scientists go and test the water in the lagoon in the same spot every single day, or uh, sorry, not every single day, that'd be a lot, every week for a whole year. And so we can get a really good snapshot of what is going on in that um, area of the lagoon. We have had a volunteer who has um, stuck with that program since the, the inception of the program. So 32 whole years, it's really, really amazing. Um, we actually are outside making some rain barrels today. Um, this is a great low impact development tool that you can use in office parks or at your own house um, that helps hold back 55 gallons of what would be just storm water running off into the lagoon um, during a major storm. And what you can do with that water is totally up to you. You can fill your bird bath, you can water your plants, wash your car, fill up your dog's pool, um, or you can just wait until it's dry and there's no rain in the forecast and just release all the water then. Um, so great low impact development tool that you can come learn to make at the Marine Resources Council. 
and um, we have a ton of other options. So I'm actually the volunteer coordinator. Um, if you are interested in volunteering with us or, or learning more about the organization, you can always feel free to reach out to me um, and we'll get something started for you guys. So that's all I've got. You know, my, my overarching message here is it doesn't, it doesn't take all of us being perfect. It just takes all of us making one aspect of our lives better and more friendly towards the lagoon. And eventually we'll get our lagoon back to that sparkling health that it once was at. So thank you so much, everybody. And I will take any questions if you guys have any questions for me. Thank you, Kaylin. Thank great. you. Um, one of my comments, it's, it's um, one of my major pet peeves. <clears throat> Is and I can't remember where I drove past it, but you can drive past any new neighborhood that's going in, and there's zero lot line. And all I can think of, and this is just a comment, there's um, is where the heck is all this water going to go when we have a hurricane or even just the storm that just hit my house just now? You know, it's all hard surfaces, so there's no place for this water to run off to, and it's it's there's no constraints around how they're building this. There's no thought put into it. They should all have solar panels on them. Every new house that comes into the state is built in the state should have solar panels. But anyway, that's just me just just um, talking about the the rainwater and the, all the hard surfaces and all these neighborhoods that are being built makes me insane. Yeah, you're right. Is that we have and you know, I think the number is 1,100 people moving into the state every single day, and we historically have had very unhealthy development. And I see it too in the new neighborhoods and condos and apartment complexes that are going up around my house. Um, is the development doesn't look like it's changing towards low impact, but we do host a yearly low impact development conference, um, and we have another one coming up in. October. So if you have any, um, you know, uh, friends on the city council or developer friends, um, definitely invite them so they can learn a little bit more about how to be healthier for our state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if you can see the hands up, but George Becker has a hand up. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. About 20 years ago, I volunteered with the Marine Resources Council to uh, plant mangroves along the uh, along the causeway on, on 520. I was wondering if you still do that. I can't do it anymore. I can't walk that well. <laughs> well, thank you for volunteering with us to plant mangroves. That's awesome. We still do mangrove plantings. Um, it's not super frequent because we do have to have a place and funding for it and obviously permits as well too. Um, we did have a mangrove planting back in July of last year, so a year ago, um, and it was on our, our own shoreline here. And unfortunately, the um, hurricanes Ian and Nicole did not uh, do super well for our new mangroves. Um, so we're, we're eventually going to have another mangrove planting out here. So <laughs> if you are interested in, in getting involved in those, you can always sign up to be a volunteer, um, and then you'll get email notifications of when we have opportunities like that. Excellent. OK. Yeah. Um, Roger has his hand up. Yeah, hi. Caitlin, um, our club, you saw that little uh, saying, I fixed the planet. Do you have a list or a place you could point us to where we could uh, kind of reproduce that in our Facebook page of things that we can do to help protect this lagoon and all lagoons? Well, I can send you guys um, some PDFs of some brochures that I have, um, if that would help. That's a, a basically just a picture that you can slap up on your your Facebook page. Yeah, I was also looking for individual actions that people can take. Oh, and that's really kind of where we're pinpointing. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, um, I think the, the biggest thing um, for our lagoon here, like Susie was was mentioning is we need to start moving towards low impact development. Um, that is really key for the amount of population that we have um, in order to you know, make sure that our, our lagoon stays beautiful. Um, we're hardening shorelines, we're tearing down mangroves. Um, these are all things that are detrimental to the lagoon. So um, one is just encourage low impact development. Um, you can even do that on your own yard. You can install a rain barrel or um, plant a rain garden. Those are great ways to hold back water on your own property. So it's not just rushing into the lagoon. Um, and then another really big one is to make sure you're not adding nutrients into the lagoon. So don't fertilize if you don't have to. All right, great, thank you. 
Yeah. Um, Kimberly has her hand up. Yeah, so to piggyback on George's comment, I remember when the zoo used to have a program where you could adopt a mangrove and, and, and grow it from its baby stage to its plantable stage. So is it possible, because I'm with George, if I, if I were living in Florida, planting would be a little tricky for me these days, but, but certainly I could, I could they're, they're, they're the easiest thing on the world not to kill, which is a good thing for me. Um, so do you have a program like that, that maybe George could, or someone else could participate in? They can't plant, but they can, they can adopt, they can foster a, a mangrove plant for a while. Yeah, we do have a, a budding program like that. Um, we call it mangrove farmers. Um, and we ask our mangrove farmers to commit to growing, um, their little mangroves for at least a year and at least 10 of them. Um, and the goal would eventually be to sort of create satellite nurseries up and down the lagoon. Um, Cause right now when people from Miami wanna buy mangroves from us, they have to drive all the way up to us in Palm Bay. Um, if our mangrove farmer program takes off like we'd like it to, um, then we would potentially have farmers down in Jupiter so they wouldn't have to drive as far. Um, so yes, if you are interested in growing mangroves, um, that's another thing, feel free to call or email and we can get you set up with that program. We'll basically give you the mangroves and the pots that they'll come in. Um, you just need to have soil, some mulch and a kiddie pool, basically a little something to, to trap water in so that they have wet feet all day. Um, so it's a, it's a great way. And like you said, they are hard to kill. Um, even for me too. So, <laughs> so it's a, it's a good program. So if you're interested in that, please feel free to call or email. Yeah. So there you go, George, you don't have to plant, but you can, but you can foster a, a, a mangrove. All right. George, you're on mute. Sorry, George, you're still on mute. No, no, I'm not. No. But anyway, yeah, I'm just to doing that. You know, what the heck? that's about all I can do anymore. It's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, just donate or sponsor a mangrove. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we can't all do everything, but some of us can do some things, and together, that's everything. Yeah. Is that through the uh, Brevard Zoo still? Well, well it's, it's through the Marine Resources Council. The, her program. Oh. Okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's sound by you, George, in Palm Bay. Yeah. Um, Ailish has her hand up. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Caitlin, that was very, very interesting. Um, I'm wondering what you do or what one can do or what we can, anyone can do or what we can all do in relation to people who seriously break the rules, uh, particularly people who live and, you know, whose water seeps, seeps through ultimately into the lagoon when they're dealing with their lawns and pesticides and all of that, who just simply ignore all the rules because I'm so that, sorry you, you cut out so I didn't hear any of your question oh, oh I could hear it that's weird it was I probably heard. my internet here <laughs> ah, that's okay I would just think thank you Caitlin can you hear me now I yes. can hear you now thank you okay I'm 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 just wondering what one or we or everyone or all of us can do as a combined force or individually just to try to uh, to try to to try to you know uh, stop the people or alleviate from people from from doing the wrong thing who just ignore the rules, particularly people whose water runs off ultimately into the lagoon and who just ignore the rules in relation to, for example, uh, you know pesticides uh, and fertilizing and all of that kind of thing because. I think both of us know, we all know that it's happening all the time. Uh, how do we deal with that? And what percentage of that would you say is, is, has responsibility for, for destroying the lagoon? Well, nutrient runoff is huge. It is everything to the lagoon, whether it's nutrients or maybe it's herbicides or pesticides. Um, but that, that is huge. It's a gigantic percentage. Um, unfortunately, there is no, um, policing of the fertilizer laws. So if you fertilize in July, there 
are no consequences. Um, so I think really what we can all do as a group is make sure that we are kindly educating our neighbors. And if we have a lawn service to make sure that your lawn service is responsible and follows lagoon friendly principles. Um, and if your lawn service doesn't, then find a different one um, and support those local businesses that are supporting the lagoon. Excellent. Okay, Ailish, uh, thank you. Um, Kras has a question. Hi, I'm sorry I was a little late to the game. So if you've answered any of these, please tell me. Um, uh, I'm a beekeeper, just a statement. I'm a beekeeper and mangrove honey is very good. It's delicious dark red honey. Um, but the question I have is, you might've talked about it in your um, speech. What, have, is there any studies going on about the ulcerations on dolphins and fish and manatees at this point? Has it been an increase in those sores or ulcerations on the fishes, fish? And I don't know if there is an increase in that. Um, I'm not sure about that because I believe that is either bacterial or viral rather than caused by um, nutrients in the water. However, I'm, I'm not super familiar with the, um, you know, the impacts on the, 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 those skin lesions that you see on those animals. Um, the, the biggest thing with, um, well, especially manatees, you know, is that they're, they're depending on seagrass as, as a food source and that is really not there anymore. So I think rather than just skin lesions, we're worried about starvation. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, so we had that huge unusual mortality event, um, last year and um they were they were you know doing necropsies on manatees that had sand in their stomachs from desperation foraging um so i, I think the the bigger issue is making sure that these animals have a food source or um the prey of these animals has a habitat um to live in so that they can they can eat so i think that i think that's the the major problem for them okay or mammals, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the one other question I have, and again, if I if I missed this in your talk, I apologize. Are they planning a different um, drainage spill system or inlet into the lagoon to increase the flush out of the lagoon? Is that something that's being planned? That is a very, very common question that we get. Um, and there, I don't know if it's still ongoing or if they're wrapping it up right now, but there is a study by Dr. Jeffrey Ebel at FIT about um, sort of that, that flush. Um, so what he's doing is near the port, he's got a unidirectional um, tube basically that will flush saline water into a small bay um, in the lagoon to sort of see what the, the changes in the water quality in that area. The, here are the main issues though with, with an inlet and why um, as an organization, we do not support um, the cutting of an inlet. Um, and it's because one, it's incredibly expensive. Um, two, it's going to displace lots of people. I'm, I'm sure if you talk to someone on beach side, they're gonna say, yeah, sure, put an inlet, but not where my house is. Right. Um, yeah, um, it's gonna take a long time to complete. Um, it's going to completely destroy the beach to the south of the um, inlet. Um, so we'd have to find somewhere to get sand to replenish the beach from. And then also, we don't know what the effect of all of that extra salt in the lagoon is going to be. Um, it's definitely going to change the water chemistry. It could definitely farm some animals. It could um, force some plants out that, that can't handle that amount of salinity. Um, so cutting an inlet is, is really you know, it's, it sounds like the easy answer um, because you look at places like Sebastian Inlet and they're, they've got clear water and it's beautiful, um, but it's really just not feasible. And I, I, I honestly don't think that it would work so well that what we need to be focusing on is solving the root of the problem, which is, which is us um, not developing properly and um, just putting tons of nutrients in the lagoon. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. All right, I don't see any more questions. Uh, Sam, are you still on? He might have had a, there you are. Sorry, I didn't mean to take the reins away from you. Oh, no. Please, that, you did a great job. I don't <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I, uh, I, just, posted, uh, I just posted a link to your organization uh, on my social media, and I'm going to do that uh, again from, uh, from LinkedIn and from our, from our Facebook page. So by all means, if you, uh, if you find yourself on the old Facebook or LinkedIn, 
uh, try to find us and we can try to share those things out and tag you guys in uh, to try to help get the word out and try to help, um, you know, share, share these concerns. So really, really appreciate your time. Um, anything else you'd like to, to say before we close up? No, just thank you guys so much for having me. And as I mentioned, if you're interested in volunteering or getting more information, um, or even just like I said, getting PDFs to share or share with your, your circle, um, please don't feel free or please feel free to reach out anytime. <laughs> thank you. Thank Caleb, you. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Take care. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for Bye. 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 Bye.